Rule number three is the right rewrite and the three write rule. All right. This is the rah rah rah. You know, this is where it says you have to keep writing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, you know, people are going to tell you this won't work. It doesn't matter because there may be somebody on a different panel who likes what you write. You know, you may fall seven times and stand up the eighth. I don't know about this last one. I think it was just a funny joke I threw. All right, so a wise man once told me, never give up on your dreams. So I always sleep past noon. I don't know how this applies. I think it was just funny, but I, I don't want you to give up on your dreams. I think it, you will win. You send the same thing out again and again and again and again. You'll find a sympathetic uh, reviewer at some point and you will get it. Okay, so I'm going to show you something. This is not meant to intimidate you. This is not meant to scare you. The first two years, 2008 to 2010, that's the number of grants I wrote. I wrote 14 grants, okay, and I succeeded on three. Now, let me tell you this. I did not write 14 different grants. It's the same grant I sent over and over again. And some of them are not even full grants. You you know, uh, let me see, like the Beckman and the BWF, I think, is the uh, um, Burroughs Welcome Fund. Oh the Barrows Welcome Fund, uh, the Doris Duke. So you can't actually write the full grant to them. You have to write a one to two page grant that goes to a local, to the School of Medicine, and they will they can pick one or two people that can write for the institution, you know, one or two people in the institution who can write. So a lot of times, these one or two page summaries that you write, it seems like it goes into a black hole. You write the, the grant and you submit it to them. You don't get any feedback. You never get caught. But it doesn't matter because every time you write it, you fix a typo. You you know you thought about it and you said you know that idea is not presented well. I'm going to fix it. So every time you write it, you're fixing it, you're making it better, and you're setting it out. So I sent AHA, the Scientist Development Grant. I forget what the HVC is. I forget what the HSI is. I can look through my the Barrows Welcome Fund, the Beckman Fund, the Doris Duke. Uh, there was something called the MTech, which was a Georgia Tech thing, and then the um, HSI I think was the um, was a part of uh, Act C2. They have these seed grants that they give out. The ones that I did succeed in getting was the Rankin Ray and the the KL2 grant. And then later on we got uh, Winship Cancer Institute had some equipment funding. So, so I wrote 14 grants. So yes, that was kind of a crazy thing to do, but it's not as hard as it sounds. It's the same grant. You write one and you keep sending it and you keep polishing it all over. But you have to send, you know, the hit ratio most places is about 25%, 20%. So you have to write a grant at least five times. If you're just playing the odds, you have to write it at least five times. And for good measure, you have to write it ten times, and then you may get a couple of them, right? Um, so, you know, that's the blue stuff, and the red stuff was what I planned to do. This is, this is a slide that I made uh, about five years ago. All right. Each grant is leverage. Multiple submissions are okay. You can send the same grant out to multiple people as long as you declare it. And I'm going to give you another example. So the two that I did succeed at the end of my first year was the Rent and Race Scholarship and the AXI, the KL2 grant here. I sent the same, well, similar grants to, to both of them. Rent and Ray gave me the grant. And the AXI was going to meet in a couple of weeks. So Rankin Ray would give you, it was either 50K, or I'm sorry, uh, 70K, 50% a year for two years, or you could take it for one year as 80%. Now the KL2 is something that gives you 75% time a year for two years. So I had the Rankin Ray, which would give me 50%. I said, okay, the wheels are churning. How do I use this to get something more? So I called Blumberg, who runs the KL2 program, and I said, hey, you know, I got this rent and raise scholarship. Do you think you could just give me one year, the second year? And I could hear his wheels cranking over the phone because, hey, this is great. He only has to give me half the money, and he could find 
somebody else he could give it to. So, you know, when he writes the report to NIH at the end of his grant, he says, well, we funded this many more people with this grant. This is just beautiful. It's win-win for, you know, he's going to get something, I'm going to get something out of it. And so the week later when they are reviewing, he puts it out. He, he must have because I've been on that panel and he, you know, they discussed this and he puts it out and says, hey, this guy only needs a year of funding, he just got a funding from Red Committee. So here's what happens, as soon as that message goes out, the committee sitting there, even if he doesn't say anything else, you've gone up in value already. Right? You have to use this, you shouldn't feel bad about, about you know, this, this. you're telling them that you, somebody else found you good enough, and this is, this is what they want to hear. Um, so, they gave me the grant, so I ended up using Grant Country for one year at 80%, and then went to KL2 for the second year at 75%. So essentially, I went up from a 50% grant to a 75% grant. This is what you should do, uh, and they like it, and you declare it to them, you discuss it with them, you know, and you discuss it with your chair, make sure that everybody is fine. And most of the time, you know, it, it is going to be fine if you're upfront about it. All right. Multiple submissions are okay. Um, maybe there's only mind rules. Just be flexible. You know, you're going to be shot down. It's okay. Fix it. Send it back. Uh, be creative. Be persistent. I don't know if I went over time. No, no. Time it is. So are there any questions uh, for Shrini again? I'm, I'm going to follow up. So they're, they're, yeah. this is like a two-part lecture today. Uh, but online or anybody here in the room have any questions for Shrini? When you submit the same grant to multiple organizations, yeah. do you have to, did you have to change the aims a little bit or? Right, that's a, that's a good question. So when you submit the same grant to multiple agencies, do you submit, do you have to change the aims? Yes, you do. In fact, we just sent uh, an SBIR to NIA, NSF and NSF doesn't have aims. They have objectives, they have engineering objectives and so on. So I'm going to turn it around and send it to the NIH. I'm going to call it AIMS. Yes, because the template for NSF is different from the template for NIH. The template for Rankin Ray is different from the template for the RSNA. And the AHA has a different template. So yes, and you're going to rewrite some of these things. And, you know, you may know people on the committee and you may know what tickles them and you're going to write the grant to 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 be something that that committee would understand better. So yes, you will be changing each one of those grants. So you could say, well, I'm writing a new grant. It, yes and no. The, right? the, the key is that they have to be, if, if, that when, the, if they get funded, if two gets funded, like, well, so you can do what Shrini did, which is say, okay, this, they're going to fund AIM 1, they're going to fund AIM 2. Okay. And that's a totally separate thing. That's totally legit. He talked with it with everybody else. You cannot submit a grant to NIH and a grant to, say, one to NCI, one to NIBIB. Same thing. Maybe tweaking the aim so they look a little bit different. Same science, though. If they both get funded, you have to give one up. Okay, it's only in, you know, circumstances like this where they're more societies or university level. Once you get to federal funding where you're talking four to five years of a plan, and you've really got like a lot of key aims and stuff, it's going to be real hard to make that totally different. You cannot double dip. That's the key thing. So yes, you can submit the same grant to as many people as you want, with or without tweaking the aims. But if multiple people end up saying, wow, I like it, and they're, they're, but you, it's the same one, you have to choose which one you want. You, you cannot take the money from both institutions. So but doing what Trinity did was fine. So I had both of them and both knew about it and I had to split it so that the first year was Rankin Ray only because Rankin Ray's rules said that if you have some other grant, you can't have the grant. And the KL2 had something similar, you, you know, so we, we split it up so that the first year was Rankin Ray and the second year. Uh, in fact, when, if you already submitted one grant and you're sending this grant to another agency in your uh, other grants section, you're going to talk about funded grants and then pending grants, you're going to have to mention it. And there you usually discuss what the overlap is. If there is an overlap in the grant and uh, even if there is an overlap in the aim. And it, I think you can even still get away with it saying, well, there is an overlap in this aim, but 
you know, if the money comes in, one of them will go to the postdoc and the other one will go to fund my time. You, you can actually still do it. You just have to be clear, declare it so everybody is on the same page so it does not look like that you're pulling, like you're pulling a fast one. Because yeah. so. then you'll never get funded again. <laughs> yeah. Once, once you get the reputation of being somebody who, who pulls, you know, a fast one, it's not going to happen to you, right? Yeah. Any other questions? And again, like I said, I'm happy to share any of these grants with me. Um, you know, I think I don't have a rent RSNA template. I have the rent convey, I have the KL2, I have the K23. Uh, and then the other grants, I can point you to them. I can say, go ask them. I can give you their grants. You know, um, most of them will be, will be willing to share their grants with you. All right? Again, any of the folks online have a question? Okay, okay, great. Well, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Okay, so I'm going to continue on the same theme, but give you some uh, uh, pointers as to where to go uh, with some of this and to get uh, some information. So the first one is finding what's right. And this is actually, I'm going to uh, actually take you to a website um, because it's a very useful website. It's the NIH website again. Um, and this is actually... Um, and the, the link is in the thing, in, in this slideshow. Um, so this is a, a website that you can actually go to to kind of plan out your career. Um, so these are the research uh, training and career development website. And as you can see, it's got, you can click any one of these tabs. There's undergraduate and postgraduate. So if you have any postdocs or undergraduates that you're mentoring, uh, they can go here and uh, it'll, it'll give you information about what types of grants they have. Uh, pre-docs, clinical doctorates, then you've got the post-docs, clinical residency grants, um, and then these are the ones that most faculty are going to be interested in is the early research career development, um, but then there's also uh, grants out there for established investigators and uh, research development mentoring, so on. And then if you simply go over to the tab here on the side, um, they've got these little kiosks, um, and it's at, you know, you kind of think it's kind of kitschy, but it's actually a good idea. So you kind of go in and say, okay, well, what are you interested in? You're interested in career development, maybe research training, fellowship, other training grants, intramural. So let's say you're interested in the career development grants, and you can go here, and again, what it like does, it actually goes through um, this sort of uh, algorithm that they have. And you can go and select, do you want to be an awardee or do you want a pointee? Uh, allows you to select out your career level, so your early career, say, um, and let's say I want to be uh, an awardee, and then it will give you all the different grants. So it's got the KO1s, the KO2, the KO7, the KO8. It'll describe each one. Um, so, for example, you can actually, if you're an established investigator, there's uh, uh, awards here, the K18, uh, will actually help an established investigator uh, enhance their career. Career transition, I talked about this one the first day. So you're a senior investigator, you've been doing CT research all your life, you want to get into MRI, but you need some more basic training. So you can take this type of, apply for this um, to get a grant. And then there's the rest of the case that, uh, that Srini was talking about. Emerging Leaders Career Development Award, a Global Leader Award, and so on. And you can click on any one of these and it'll simply go uh, to the sites and then it'll talk about you know, what the purpose is, It'll give you the eligibility requirements, relevant notices, the PARs, and everything else. So this is uh, one incredibly useful uh, website to go to. And again, it, it's just a good idea to kind of just peruse it and see, you know, what they ha have to offer and so on. Um, there's a couple of other points um, so that uh, the NIH uh, allows you to do. And... Let me just get the right web page up. Um, so NIH designations. There's two designations that most people should be aware of when applying to the NIH. Uh, one is new investigator. A new investigator is simply someone who has never successfully uh, received um, substantial NIH independent research award. And I'll show you what that means in a second. And you can be any age for this. You can be a senior professor with tenure. The only requirement is that you have never received an NIH independent research award. 
Early stage investigator is a second designation from the NIH. And this one, to claim this, you have to be within 10 years of completing your terminal research degree or medical residency. Um, so for PhDs, this is at the end of when you received your degree. Um, for uh, clinicians, this is at the end of your residency. Um, I, I don't think it includes the fellowship. Now, why is all of this important? Because there are brownie points. When you get reviewed, when you have checked either or both of these boxes, the review committee, like we discussed last week, will go through, you'll get your grant scored and so on, but then when it goes to that next stage committee, you actually get some points added or subtracted, depending on how you like, like the system. But basically, you get brownie points. Um, now, the number of points, it's, it, the NIH is never going to publish this anywhere. I have heard everything from five points to five percentage points to five percentile points. So it all kind of depends on who you talk to. But basically, the good thing is that there are brownie points. Um, so what does not count against you? What do they mean by substantial NIH funding? None of these will count against you. So you could get any one of these awards, and you could still be a new investigator. Basically, from the NIH perspective, it's an R01 that counts as substantial funding. So you can have an R21, you can have an R03, you can have a, a conference grant, you can have um, equipment grants, grants from other agencies, including NSF. So if you're PI on a grant from NSF, you could still at the NIH be considered a new investigator because it's not NIH money. Uh, if you've been on anybody's uh, T awards, those don't count. Any of the training grants, SBIRs, if you've had your own company and you've been out there and you've gotten an award through your company, that does not count against you. Um, so always be sure, and this is up to you, um, for, to check that new investigator box if you are a new investigator. I believe you can also check the ESI box, but the NIH, when it goes through the process, checks on that one um, and uh, compares your degree uh, with, you know, what, 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 data, what the data is now. So again, very important to be aware of your status and claim these if you can. Um, I showed you this last time. Uh, these are the scoring criteria, but these are specifically for these training grants. These are the F series and the K series, uh, the F being the fellowship grants and the Ks being the career development. And notice I specifically boxed the scored criterion. Um, overall impact is going to be important, but notice what's here and what they're scoring. Remember on an R01, they're pretty much scoring you on the science, um, your reputation, uh, you know, and, and so on. The top thing on this list is you, the fellowship applicant, and on the career awards, the candidate. You, what you present in your grant, your history, your goals, your life dreams, is actually a scored criterion when you're writing these grants. So as Srini noted, a third of it is your science plan, a third of it is your career development plan in you, and that is score. So you want to really be um, this combination of, you know, tooting your own horn, but humble pie as well. So, you know, you've got to come across as, as sincere and everything. And notice number two is your sponsors, your collaborators, and your consultants. And then on the other one, it's your mentors, your co-mentors and consultants. These are critical as well. And as Srini said, I mean, he really carefully went through, crafted the letters, and in the grant itself, carefully crafted um, how he presented those mentors and, and what they were going to help with. Then all the other things are there as well, the research plan, the training potential, and all that. But again, the scoring criteria here, when you write these grants, yes, the science is important, but it's not always the main criterion that you're going to be judged on. So it's, it's a slightly different beast. And a lot of the, you know, the Rankin-Ray, um, the, the giraffes, um, all the other ones that are training grants are to some extent going to look at you and your mentorship team in addition to the science. So that, that applies to all other organizations as well. Now I'm going to mention this one because um, a lot of people simply don't know that it exists. Um, this is the NIH Loan Repayment 
program. Um, and basically this was set up, it's all again funded through Congress and everything, to recruit and retain highly qualified health professionals into biomed and biobehavioral research careers. And they basically are, are saying, okay, we will help you pay off all your student loans. This isn't your car loan, this isn't your house loan, these are specifically your student loans. But they will repay up to $35,000 annually of qualified educational debt uh, in return for a commitment to engage in NIH mission-related research.